you've got an entity that knows the scriptures extremely well. You've got an entity that's that's experienced in the vicinity of these mounds. You've got instances of of it actually manipulating matter to shape shift. The large bird that these guys shot at this this dogman werewolf thing, whatever it was that, that they saw. The fact that you've got the typical uh, sort of like poltergeist activity associated with it. All of these to me point to point to a, a demon. You're talking about either one of the pre-flood or the post early post-flood giants. The Institute of Biblical Anthropology is devoted to the research of cultural and supernatural phenomena in the light of the biblical paradigm. Conventional and novel approaches to sound biblical study provide the direction for the Institute's research and teaching in an age of change and prophetic significance. Dr. Judd Burton is the Director and Senior Fellow at the Institute of Biblical Anthropology. He is an historian, an anthropologist, with 25 years experience teaching history, anthropology, archaeology, religion, humanities, and Bible in academia and conferences. Within the scope of the IPA's educational offerings, students may undertake 12 core certification programs, Biblical Anthropology, Biblical Demonology, Preternatural Morphology, Mythology, Ancient Near Eastern Civilization, and Mediterranean Civilization. We are kicking off the school with preternatural morphology and the additional courses will be dropping regularly. Dr. Judd Burton formally invites you to acquire a membership to gain full access to the course content today. I have but one question for you. Can you attend my class? Father in heaven, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I apply the blood of Jesus and cover all technology involved in what we are about to execute. I bind all demons on assignment against the technology in the name of Jesus. I pray that any altars or parts of individuals that would be involved in any way in creating havoc, ruination, or any form of sabotage, including going out of body, linking arms, or joining hands to tamper with the technology would be stopped, locked down, and put to sleep in the name of Jesus. We come in your name, and your name is the most powerful. Just protect us. Bless our time in here. Amen. Amen. The Bell Witch Mystery is one of America's most well-documented stories of paranormal activity. It's been corroborated by hundreds of witnesses, one of which would eventually become the President of the United States. Some say that it was so powerful that it would eventually be able to kill John Bell. Now after 200 years, no one has been able to solve the mystery of the Bell Witch but I think we got it figured out. to help me dig deeper into this supernatural historical event. Chris Price, Tori Peterson, and Dr. Judd Burton of the podcast Camp Hermon. Chris and Tori went to the site to investigate. The Bell Cave is located in Adams, Tennessee, four miles from the Kentucky border, about an hour and a half northeast of Nashville. We had a meetup planned for Camp Hermon we were down in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, 
because there were some recent sighting, recent Bigfoot sightings this past year. And so a group of us got together. Tori came in from uh, Kansas. So since I was going to be down there anyway, Chris had this idea that we should go up to Adams, Tennessee, to the Bell Witch Cave and Homestead. They remade the house to look just like how the original house looked, and then they filled it with all these mannequins. But they also have a room full of newspaper articles and books and other like relics, um, like historical relics um, from people who experience things at the farm and um, just really well documented. I think that's worth noting because a lot of ghost stories are kind of like, you know, they're just ghost stories like, did it happen or didn't it? We also went in the cave and they did say that they used it for cold storage, but um, there was also a, a grave there that had been disturbed, so. Just to kind of set the, the backdrop here, we're talking about the early 19th century. And this key window that we're looking at is between 1817 and 1821. This story is, is a well-attested one in both the lore and the history of our nation. The strangeness of the apparition of the witch itself cannot be overstated. Much of its attention seemed to have been focused on on uh, a young lady in the family, Betsy. The entire family had to deal with the depredations of this this spirit. Now, it's often called the Bill Witch because it identified itself uh, as such, and it actually responded to a name. The year is 1817 and 67-year-old John Bell goes for a walk like he did almost every single night. But this night, he stumbled on what some would call a cryptid dog creature. If you don't know what cryptids are, they're animals that have supernatural and natural traits at the same time, like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and Dogman. And he actually encountered a, a dog-like creature. Um, it's described as being a black dog, but its head was kind of smaller than it should be for the size of the dog. And it its head almost looked like a bunny. So it was like a dog, bunny, problematic looking creature in the woods. And it weirded him out enough that he shot at it. But the image of the black dog uh, is very interesting and telling uh, as well, because that has historically been one of the physical manifestations of demons and in particular, uh, of Satan himself. In an orchard on the property, I believe it was Betsy Bell, saw a woman in the distance and spoke to the woman, but the woman did not speak to her, but then the woman vanished. And so they considered it an apparition. And I think that happened several times within the next few days where she was actually seeing this spirit. Later that night, John, his wife, and nine of his children began experiencing the quote, unquote, Bell Witch. They were experiencing knocking and scratching on the outside of the cabin. But when John would go out there and investigate, nothing would be there. Soon thereafter, the creepy sounds were coming from inside the house. Children said it sounded like there were rats gnawing on their beds. But they turn on the lights or candles or what have you, and there was nothing in the room. On another night, the family was awakened by a plethora of scary sounds, dogs growling and barking. And hearing the sound of like wings flapping against the ceiling. The, the sound of dogs and chains coming from the second level of the cabin that they would hear while they were there. Needless to say, they were all terrified. Shortly after this, the entity is able to manipulate the physical realm. The children report that invisible hands were pulling the covers off of their beds. Betsy, the daughter, actually started having her hair pulled. She was being pricked with needles and um, actually had like bruises and scratches to, to show that something was happening. The, 
the suns actually shot at a couple of birds during the course of these events, which they described as oversized. Uh, but its ability to manipulate matter uh, is interesting too, not just not just in terms of the forms that it took with regard to the bird. Almost an entire year passes with the Bell family keeping this terrifying secret all to themselves. When John Bell finally invites his neighbor, James Johnson, and his wife to spend the night to see if they experience the apparition. He confides in Mr. Johnston and asks him to come to the house because he's a, a trustworthy man. He's a Christian man, well-known in the community. And all of these noises start to happen that are common to the Bells by this time. James has a little bit different approach to this phenomenon. He talks to it. Although this being isn't quite ready for a full-on conversation, it shows signs of intelligence and that it's paying attention when he speaks. I don't know if it was Mr. Johnson or Bell said, who are you and what do you want? And says the voice answered feebly, I am a spirit. I was once very happy but have been disturbed. So after their neighbors witness the entity as well, and they're sure that they're not going crazy, John decides to let people come over and investigate the happenings. So word spreads throughout Red River pretty quick. At first, spectators would ask simple questions, like how many people are in the room? And then this spirit would knock or scratch the number on the wall. Here's the thing, it's always right. After several weeks, the spirit tries to speak, but it's barely audible. Each time it seemed to get more strength to speak until eventually it speaks clearly in a woman's voice. The Bell family asks the disembodied voice, who are you? She tells them that she's a Native American woman who lived near there and was buried. She says, once I was very happy until my bones were disturbed. Now this rings true to the Bell family because a few years prior to the haunting, a few of John Bell's sons were exploring in the forest and came across a burial site. They dug up some of the bones and then returned home with a skull. Now kids being kids, they were playing around with it and one of the teeth was dislodged from the jawbone and was lost under the floorboard. When John found out that his boys were doing this, he instructed them to take the skull back to the gravesite and rebury it exactly where they found it. They did, but a tooth was missing. So this alleged Native American spirit tells John that she's been looking for her tooth and when she finds it she can be at peace again consequently john spends days ripping up the floorboards searching for the lost tooth he eventually has to give up and the spirit begins to laugh hysterically and tells him that she made the whole thing up and that there's no connection between her and the bones his sons found Even though she deceived the family once into thinking she was the spirit of an indigenous woman who lived in the area, they were convinced that if they could figure out who she was and what she wanted, that they could get her to go. So they gave it another try. Now this time she says that she's not a spirit at all, but an actual living, breathing person. She claims that she's a witch possibly astro projecting into their house and messing with them. She even gives them a name, Kate Bats. Kate is an outcast in Red River, but it's well known that you don't want to get on her bad side. Rumor has it that she is a witch and practices dark magic. Some of the Red River locals thought that they had this whole thing figured out. There was a rumor that Kate and John had a feud over some property and money and that she was holding a grudge against him and using witchcraft to haunt him. 
But investigating this a little further, you come to find out that John never had a feud with her, but it was with her brother-in-law. In fact, the Bell family is one of the Oling families in the city that didn't have a problem with Kate. John and the family conclude that the spirit lied once before and now is lying again, but the name sticks. Many skeptics introduce theories and try to debunk this, say it's all a hoax, but no one can prove that it is a hoax. And when they try to disprove it, the spirit begins to haunt them. Amongst the other activities that that sources tell us about include that this thing could travel long distances. In fact, there was a, a skeptic from uh, England at one point who visited the family property uh, and uh, sort of poo-pooed the idea. And he claimed that after he went back to England, uh, that this spirit had placated uh, his parents. Uh, so we've, we've got an ambulatory spirit here. Over the next year, preachers, magicians, ghost hunters, and the like come to visit the Bell property and try and figure out what's going on. Even future president Andrew Jackson gets in on the action. Jackson and I believe several of his friends were traveling there partially because they heard about the Bell Witch and kind of wanted to laugh it off or, you know, but on the way their wagon got stuck and would not budge. And so, you know, they'd hoist it up and take the wheels off and put them back on and spin them in the air and everything was working. And then, and then they'd get going again and it wouldn't budge. The team was simply unable to start the wagon. Not a wheel turned, although they were on level ground. The general examined the wagon and said there was no reason why the horses could not pull it. The driver again tried them without success. The general then shouted, It's the witch! A voice called from the roadside, They can go on now, general. Neither the general nor the men with him could see anyone, but distinctly heard the voice and its promise to see them that night. Betsy said as soon as her father saw General Jackson, he had him and the entire party come to the house and entertain them with a good dinner and stories of when the Indians were on the farm and the mounds and relics of the mound builder. In the party was a man who claimed to be a real witch tamer. He thought no witch could appear while he was present. The other members of the party had been bragging on him and on his having the witch bluffed. He said his pistol was loaded with a silver bullet and he just wanted to try it out on this witch. Finally, he dared the witch out. The general was beginning to be impatient at the delay in the appearance of the witch, when suddenly the braggart jumped from his chair, grabbed at the seat of his trousers and shouted, Boys, I'm being stung by a thousand pins! A voice spoke out, I'm in front of you, shoot. The man drew his pistol and tried to shoot, but it would not fire. Then the voice cried, it's my night for fun. Soon there was heard repeated slapping of the man's jaws and he yelled, it's pulling my nose off. Making a break for the door, which flew open, he jumped out running with all of his speed toward the wagon, yelling every step while the voice kept giving him all sorts of advice. General Jackson fairly roared with laughter and told her father that he had never seen or heard of anything so funny and mysterious and would like to stay a week which he was invited to do. Again, the voice spoke saying, there is another fraud in your party, General. I'll get him tomorrow night. It is getting late, go to bed. Eventually, Andrew Jackson and his men leave with no explanation, but a lot of scary stories. John began to have these episodes where his tongue would swell up and he wouldn't even be able to eat for days at a time. As his condition began to get worse, his face started twitching uncontrollably and he would have seizures. The doctors were baffled as they had no idea what was happening to John. But John is convinced that the witch is causing all of this. And when John was at his worst, the witch proclaimed to him that she is going to kill him. On December 19th, 1820, John Bell goes into a coma. 
and one of his sons goes to the cabinet to get his medicine. And I guess the family opened the cabinet to find where his medicine normally was, and in its place there was a vial that was filled with a black liquid. The spirit proclaims that she switched out his meds, and he already had taken it, and he would die. And sure enough, the next day, John died. Frustrated, one of the sons throws the vial of black poison into the fire and a huge ball of blue fire goes up the chimney. After John died, the spirit becomes a lot less active, but she does have one more request. She wants Betsy to break up with her boyfriend. During this time, Betsy was getting close to a gentleman named Joshua Gardner. Betsy and Joshua became engaged and now the witch begins to harass both of them wherever they go. The voice keeps telling Betsy not to marry Josh. Eventually, Betsy gets so frustrated she breaks up with Josh and the witch wins again. Eventually, a pretty convoluted theory begins to surface. So this teacher I know had like a creepy fondness for Betsy. And it's reported that he was caught red-handed doing some black magic. Some say that this creepy teacher had to kill John Bell to get him out of the way so he can marry Betsy. We have a creepy teacher dabbling in the occult and then we have stuff happening at the house with like a fixation on this daughter Betsy and then the spirit also wants to get the dad out of the way. So, so that seems kind of suspicious to me. And the crazy thing is, is that when Betsy broke up with Joshua Gardner, this teacher came back into her life and eventually they did get married. After this, the witch is satisfied and she left, but she did promise to return in seven years and she did just that. Apparently she showed up and conversed with John Jr. and had some interesting prophecies, most of which did not come true, but she accurately did predict the civil war. John Jr. reports that he had a conversation with the Bell Witch about how Christianity needed to be reinvigorated in America. Can you imagine that? A witch having a conversation about a Christian revival? She then promises that she will return in a hundred years and visit the closest descendant of the Bell family. So many have offered explanations of exactly what the Bell Witch was. And for some reason, I just never been satisfied with anything that I've heard. And I really feel that there's a possible connection to this spirit with the Nephilim. Drink Camp Hermann's Bigfoot Blend alone. Be bold, be humble, be Kevlar. Drink Bigfoot. Much of my training was in, in New Testament and church history. I was drawn to the, the usage of Greek by the, the writers of the New Testament. And the phrasing that was used to describe demonic entities in, in different passages, and one of the most recurrent of them is, of course, uh, uh, unclean or evil spirits, which is interesting because this, this plugs us back into this, the Second Temple Jewish period literature of the Essenes, uh, and specifically the Book of Enoch, uh, in which the the judgment that's passed down upon the progeny of the, the fallen angels, the sons of God, and uh, human females, the Nephilim, this first race of giants that we have before the, the Noahic flood, their punishment is to be, of course, in, in terms of their bodies, to be destroyed in the deluge. Enoch goes on in this sort of legal pronouncement against the, the spirits of the Nephilim that there are to be uh, unclean spirits, evil spirits upon the earth, and that they're constantly trying to, to sate the, des the desires that they had had when they had bodies, and that's why they seek to inhabit flesh. In terms of the, 
pronouncement here in apocryphal literature, which consequently is cited in canon scripture, specifically in places like Jude and Second Peter. But what we have here is a clear legal explication and origin point for demons. In other words, we're not talking about the same kinds of entities as fallen angels. They're all part of the same cabal, but we're talking about a different kind of, of middle ranking, lower ranking spiritual entity in the form of the demons. And the linguistic and cultural analysis here leads us invariably to uh, their origins being pre-flood as the spirits, the disembodied spirits of these destroyed Nephilim. Many Native American tribes describe a time when the Americas were inhabited by an ancient race of white giants. The linking of this spirit to a, a mound, it was actually on the property uh, of the Bell family was interesting to me uh, because of the association with mounds in North America with, with the tribes of giants that several Native American tribes have fought. A gentleman named Horatio Bradwell Cushman wrote a book in 1899 chronicling the histories of several tribes, one of which was the Choctaw. According to their oral histories, there was a race of giants that lived in the now state of Tennessee that their ancestors fought while migrating from the West. This race of giants is said to have been cannibals, and when the Choctaw came in contact with these guys, they would always want to fight them to the death. Every tribe in North America has a lore about these giants, and most often they had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, double rows of teeth with hair that was red or, or tinged red. But what's interesting is the, how these tribes address the issue of giants from their behavior were not to be trusted. They weren't potential allies. And in some cases, tribes fought full-scale wars with them, uh, on bo really on both sides of the country. The Navajo tribe has a very similar legend. They describe them as a regal race of white giants endowed with mining technology who dominated the West, enslaved lesser tribes, and had strongholds all through the Americas. They were either extinguished or went back to the heavens according to their lore. In 1553, Pedro Siza de Leon wrote in Chronicle of Peru about legendary giants described to him by the Manta indigenous people. The natives relate the following tradition which had been received from their ancestors from this very remote times. There arrived on the coast in boats made of reeds, as big as large ships a party of men of such size that from the knee downwards their height was as great as the entire body of an ordinary man though he might be of good stature their limbs were all in proportion to the deformed size of their bodies and it was a monstrous thing to see their heads with hair reaching to their shoulders their eyes were as large as small plates Leon said that the sexual habits of the giants were revolting to the natives and that heaven eventually wiped them out because of those habits. This ancient tribe describes almost exactly the same story as the Bible does. That this race of giants had sexual habits and doing all kinds of crazy stuff that the Great Spirit wiped out the entire race. Genesis 6-4 tells the same thing. Now either this tribe had a Bible or they recorded the same event. The Book of Enoch talks about how the fallen angels had went to Enoch and asked Enoch to talk to God on their behalf that their offspring that when they died that they could go to heaven instead of just roam the earth as demons. Now of course God said no because the entire thing was an abomination. So it said that these demons are still roaming the earth today. You've got an entity that knows the scriptures extremely well. You've got an entity that's that's experienced in the vicinity of these mounds. You've got 
instances of of it actually manipulating matter shapeshift the large bird that these guys shot at this this dogman werewolf thing whatever it was that that they saw the fact that you've got the typical uh sort of like poltergeist activity associated with it all of these to me point to point to a, a demon you're talking about either one of the pre-flood or the post early post-flood giants one thing that people that are in witchcraft know about are familiar spirits spirits that know things about you they know things about your father your mother your ancestors these entities these demons they're thousands of years old they've been observing humans for thousands of years i'm just thinking about the people who i know best who i've spent a lot of time with and you get to a point even like your friends where you can almost kind of predict like i know how they're going to react to this i know what they're going to say to this you know so they're simply guessing you can predict what someone is going to do based on what they have done that power begins to fall apart at the mention of the name of jesus So if you're anything like me, you're extremely curious about the origin of our reality. Where did we come from and where are we going? But in the here and now, I am completely obsessed with the origin of the spiritual realm as it's been around a lot longer than we have and is potentially inhabited by super intelligent beings that some would contend are affecting the very direction of humanity. Perhaps that's why the Bible refers to Jesus as the name that is above every name. If there are indeed other creatures out there beyond our realm, but have access to our realm, and Jesus is who he says he is, then his followers need to step up and realize their true calling. In the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, it talks about Jesus and it describes him in this way, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a few details that didn't make it into this video about this story. This entity known as the Bell Witch knew the Bible very well. And seven years after John Bell died, John Bell Jr. says that he met with this entity and had a conversation. I only mentioned it very briefly in this video, but they had a conversation about how Christianity needed to be revived in America. So I did a little digging and there's a possibility that this is directly connected to the false prosperity gospel that's been preached in America for a long time. So the Mount Hermon podcast is going to have me on their show and I'm going to take you down this rabbit hole. Many millennia ago, at the peak of Mount Hermon in the Golan Heights, a group of divine beings known as the Watchers, or Sons of God, descended in an act of rebellion against their king, Yahweh. By teaching them the secret knowledge of the cosmos, they sought to wrestle dominion of the earth away from humanity. They bore children with them, and their offspring were both human and divine. These giants are the demigods of old, and the events that transpired would forever alter the course of human history. At Camp Hermon, we discuss the oddities of the ancient world and their lingering impact on our world today. Welcome.